It's the most used room in the house, where we prepare for the day to come, or wash off the day that was. It takes molten metal, powdered glass, and rendered fat to help us take care of business. Seven million cell phones a year are dropped in the toilet. From touch-free to low flow to pay as you go. Hello. Now, Bathroom Tech 2 on Modern Marvels. and glam of Las Vegas, where dreams can come true, or more than likely, go down the drain. While most of us will have to settle for a standard hotel room here, a few high rollers with hefty lines of credit might snag an invitation to one of these exclusive Wynn Resort Fairway Villa Suites, with equally exclusive bathroom facilities. We're in one of the Fairway Villa suite bathroom accommodations, and we've tried to anticipate every comfort. Each one-bedroom villa suite features a powder room, as well as two adjoining master bathrooms. These are his and hers bathrooms. There's one with considerations for the lady, and one with specific considerations for the gentleman. In the men's room, we have an enormous steam shower. This shower is lined in brown fantasy marble, which we import from China, and features a rain dome, massage shower head, full steam capabilities, and a heated mirror for shaving that will not fog. A very large lav with a counter that is large enough to handle all of the toiletries that any gentleman might bring. Everything in the men's area also has been raised a bit. And of course, there's a flat screen TV. The ladies' room is just as posh. This particular room has a floor of spider marble, which we import from Greece. The countertops are Arco Iris Onyx that I fly to Italy so that I can hand select each slab. There's also an overflow tub with built-in LEDs to help wash away those Sin City sins. And of course, no high-end bathroom is complete without a private glass encased bidet and toilet area. Regardless how high or low your end is, we're all slaves to the common commode. This modern marvel changed the world by efficiently eliminating the waste most people don't want to think about. At American Standard, located in the aptly named Piscataway, New Jersey, these potty people have put a great deal of thought into making some of the best toilets on the market. For those who like one that's unstoppable, meet the King of Thrones, the Champion Four. American Standard makes the bold claim that this titanic of toilets is virtually uncloggable. We put it to the test to see what goes down with a ship. Some of the things that go into toilets that really shouldn't are toys and cell phones. Up to seven million cell phones a year are dropped in the toilet. And so, we do consider those things when we're designing, but these are not things that belong in your toilet. Another industry test is called the dye exchange test for the removal of liquid waste. So far, it passes the test. And then there's this little experiment using a stand-in for something that's no stranger to being flushed. Another industry test is to take miso, which is soy paste, and put it in a latex container. This container holds 50 grams of miso. Studies show that humans can eliminate up to 350 grams of solid waste. So I have 500 grams here in my hand, and we test toilets like the Champion 4 up to 1,000 grams. So let's put them in the toilet. And flush. Why does the Champion 4 prevail where some other toilets can fail? This is probably the flush valve in the toilet that you have now. It's roughly two inches in diameter. 
A high performance toilet may have a flush valve that's three inches in diameter. And the Champion 4 has this four inch diameter accelerator flush valve. You can see it's very large and allows the water to leave the tank at a very rapid rate. The other difference with the Champion 4 is that the trapway is two and three eighths inches in diameter, which is the largest that you can purchase. Most toilets have just a two inch trapway. That extra three eighths of an inch can make all the difference between a flushing success and a flushing failure. When you trip the lever, 1.6 gallons of water exit through the piston action flush valve in under a second. The rest of the sequence is generally similar with all toilets. Some of the water travels through the rim into the bowl. The remaining water goes down a channel and into the trapway. A siphon effect combined with gravity pulls everything down the drain. Thanks to a set of water usage regulations passed by the Environmental Protection Agency in 1992, the Champion 4 and all newer toilets have only 1.6 gallons per flush with which to work. But enterprising engineers, including those at American Standard, thought they could do better. This FlowWise toilet, known as an HET, does its job while surpassing government regulations. The FlowWise flushes on 20% less water, and that's 1.28 gallons per flush. It's important because the toilet is one of the largest consumers of water in a person's household. The FlowWise owes part of its success to the unique shape and height of its tank and bowl, which allow it to flush with less water. The rest is fluid dynamics and good old gravity. You can see on the screen is the FlowWise bowl. If the shape comes out wrong, we lose the performance. It's actually a very small margin of error. With a cutaway, we can see all the components together that give us maximum performance. American standards engineers aren't just toiling to improve the inner workings of the humble toilet. The exterior gets some attention, too. While the toilet looks basically the same over the last 100 years, from an ergonomic standpoint, they have changed. In recent history, the toilets have gotten taller. And this is really driven by aging of boomers. Boomers do not want to admit they're getting older, and I, I'm a boomer myself. And so by raising up the height of the toilet, it's easier to get on and off. One of the issues with the developments of toilets is that we as a population are growing larger. Weight is an issue within our population. So we work to make sure we engineer our toilets to take a heavier load. A number of companies have developed physically larger toilets uh, to deal with larger sized people. Once a design is approved, American Standards version of the Porcelain God gets a rigorous workout before going into production. This toilet seat will be hammered with 200 pounds of pneumatic force over 10,000 times. And these toilets will be flushed about 10,000 times per week for 25 weeks. After you've flushed, the next stop for most of us is the sink. The modern sink has changed civilization because it allows people to wash their hands every time, multiple times during the day without having to bother with disposing the water, which has inhibited the spread of germs and sicknesses, it allows people perfect hygiene by being able to brush their teeth more often. It's a very simple thing, but do without your sink for a while and see where you are. At the Kohler Company in Kohler, Wisconsin, man and machine join forces to produce the simple yet indispensable sink. Here, your sink starts off as a pile of manhole covers, car parts, dumbbells, and other scrap iron. A powerful magnet carries the scrap to a furnace, heated to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Workers slag off the impurities in preparation for the big pour. Meanwhile, the sink molds, made from sand mixed with water and chemical binders, wait on the other side of the factory. 
During the molding process, you actually have two halves of a mold. When we put them together, there's about a quarter of an inch in between, and that's what fills with the iron. The melt is brought over by forklift and poured into the molds. It takes just a minute for the molten metal to solidify and another couple of hours for the sinks to cool enough to be sent for grinding and cleaning. We're doing that robotically. Then it's going and actually clearing out the drain hole and the supply hole. Once that's complete, it sets it back off on the conveyor over here where it comes to the, the grinder who will manually remove the remaining plastic and any high iron on the piece prior to getting it ready for enameling. Sprayers apply a coat of pink slurry that will act as a primer to help the enamel adhere to the iron. Then it's into an oven for eight minutes. Now the casting has been reheated up to approximately 1,700 degrees. We're going to take it out of the furnace and then bring it over here and place it in the enameling frame where they'll apply the first coat of enamel glass. That's in a powder format. It's important to get as much on as quick as you can when the casting's the hottest. So they'll complete this first coat right now, and then it goes back into the furnace where they'll melt that in. One more cycle, and this bath lab is ready to go. But the lab is just part of the sink equation. The obligatory faucet begins life in another foundry just down the street. Only here, they're melting brass at 1,800 degrees. A forklift carries the molten metal to the casting area, where it'll start to take shape inside a metal mold with a sand core. At this point, he's putting the sand core into the die. Now he's getting his liquid metal, and he's going to pour it. He steps on the pedal. The die rotates. The metal flows into the die with gravity. Right now it is solidifying, it takes about 20 seconds to solidify. At that point he takes it out, puts it in a cart to cool, and it'll then look like this. Then the faucet is machined, polished, and prepped for plating. In the plating area, this giant dipping rig filled with various acids, cleaning agents, and chemical compounds ensures your faucet's metalwork doesn't become a pile of rust from oxidation and corrosive hard water deposits. The entire plating operation, lending the faucets their protective layers, takes about 90 minutes. Then Kohler has to make them look nice. This happens in the PVD room, where metallurgy meets chemistry. In physical vapor deposition over the top of the chrome layer, we put a, usually it's zirconium nitride, titanium nitride coating over the top to give us the, the, the different colors that Kohler sells. The pieces are preheated and then placed inside this vacuum chamber for 90 minutes, where they'll be bombarded with metallic ions with the help of turbo molecular pumps. This electronic coating process will determine the faucet's finish. Everything from vibrant brushed bronze to polished chrome to brushed nickel. Then the faucets are off to this area, where spouts and handles of all imaginable designs are assembled, tested, and packaged. In today's marketplace, there's lots of different types of faucets. For the bathroom, you have a separate hot and cold, and you can control both on individually. You also have the single lever faucet, which is easy to use, great for children and people that have arthritis. Going back to the old days are the bridge faucets. And what that means is that there's one portion of the uh, faucet that goes in between that connects the hot and cold above the counter as opposed to below. Aesthetics aside, the technology of sink faucets is still predominantly based on simple mechanics. But the shower has jumped into the cyber age. Most toilets flush in the key of E-flat. Bathroom Tech 2 will return on Modern Marvels.
These days, shopping for a new shower can be a little like shopping for a car. This model, developed by the Kohler company, comes fully loaded. This is the DTV2. What makes DTV2 unique, it's a fully personalizable digital delivery system of water, lights, sound, and audio in the shower. The DTV2 incorporates water delivery with a digital valve. In conjunction with the user interface, the digital valve assembly precisely controls and maintains water temperature. No more waiting for your shower to heat up and then having it go cold. The valve also regulates water delivery and massage. There's also a steam function. Steam showers originally were used as a therapy. Today, they're a luxury that are used in some of the finer homes. Uh, they're electric. Water falls down on a hot coil or stainless steel plate. The steam is created. The shower also has a little something for the other senses. What you see behind me is the ambient rain panel, which is a 21-inch LED lit panel. It also incorporates audio. You can hook up your computer or any MP3 player to it and take any of those files and actually play them in the shower through our waterproof speakers. It's like having a private disco in your shower. And there's more. But maybe the coolest feature is the different effects that we have. Let's say you've always wanted a skylight in your bathroom, you can pick our sunny clouds feature next to moving clouds in your ceiling. Mix and match the options to reflect or enhance your mood. The shower's entire symphony of functions is conducted by the remote user interface that can save and instantly recall personal settings. Because some of the DTV2's parts are delicate, workers must hand assemble and inspect them individually. And needless to say, installing the DTV2 is a bit more complicated than your run-of-the-mill shower. The water delivery portion is going to have a different valve installation behind the wall, but your plumber can easily do that. Where it's going to be different is you have to include an electrician for some parts of the system, such as the lighting, the audio, and some of the pieces behind the wall. You also might need to include an integrator, someone who helps with setting up home networks to help you with the audio piece. The whole shebang, hydrotherapy, chromotherapy, and all the rest, will probably run you somewhere in the area of $10,000 but it still might be cheaper than a future of actual therapy. I think the future of the home shower is basically personalizing your shower. What you see here is personalization on a pretty big level. Of course, to know where the shower is going, it helps to know where it's been. It's documented in vases and murals, places that we see drawings of ancient Greeks that showered. They showered not for hygiene. They believed it energized them and gave them power. Cold water flowed via terracotta pipes and over the bathers through shower heads shaped like animal faces. The ancient Romans and many generations thereafter preferred their baths to showering. Rudimentary shower contraptions began to resurface in the early 1800s. Like this one, called the American Virginia Stool Shower. The bather placed the wood machine inside a bathtub and operated a hand pump to bring water up a hose and out over his head. A foot pedal maneuvered an attached scrub brush up and down as needed. For decades, the shower remained a novelty. Only when indoor plumbing became more commonplace in the mid to late 19th century, could showers become practical. Still, well into the 20th century, most Americans bathed in tubs, but only about once or twice a week. During the post-World War II tract housing boom, builders incorporated showers into most bathrooms, making it easier for people to begin a transition to a more frequent washing routine. The major shift between the bathtub and the shower came in the 1970s. It came about because people were in a larger hurry, wanted to get ready quicker, and were more interested in cleanliness. To accommodate new, larger conveniences like standalone showers, 
Today's average master bathroom has roughly doubled in size since the 1950s. But space and price tag aside, a luxury shower can carry another cost if you're not careful. Large rain head or multiple side sprays can use on average between 10 and 20 gallons of water per minute. Most of us still have one of these, a standard shower head. Shower heads produced prior to the EPA Act of 1992 expelled about five gallons of water per minute. Today, regulations have reduced that to 2.5 gallons per minute. But which uses more water? Bathing in a tub? Or showering with a standard shower head? A shower head that uses two and a half gallons a minute will use 25 gallons over a 10 minute period, where the average tub holds about 50 gallons of water. So a 10 minute shower would use roughly half as much water as a bathing in the tub. American Standard has put a new spin on low flow with a FlowWise version of the shower head. The FlowWise uses just one and a half gallons per minute, but the bather is none the wiser and none the dirtier. A conventional 2.5 gallons per minute shower head does little more than deliver a metered amount of pressurized water through small holes. The FlowWise shower head incorporates a small turbine located in the center. Pressurized water makes it spin. The turbine breaks up the droplets while infusing them with air as they're pushed out. The air makes less water seem like the same amount. So that at a gallon and a half a minute, you get a nice, forceful shower. As a compromise, American Standard has also incorporated an element of personal choice. If you're taking a shower and you're all soaked up, have shampoo in your hair, and you want to rinse, you just convert the shower to a maximum of two gallons a minute. It's a combination of the turbine and an outer spray pattern. And this way you get a good satisfying rinse. The great thing about FlowWise is when you turn it off, it automatically resets itself to a gallon and a half. This way you're always conserving water and you have to choose to use more. Before the FlowWise and their other products reach your bathroom, American Standards design team puts them through demanding life cycle tests. This is our FlowWise shower head. And what we're doing right now on this reliability test rig is making sure that the two different settings work properly over time. This reliability test rig runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We start the cycle going and computers run all of this. And at the end of the day and over the weekend, we turn off the lights and go home, but the test continues so that we can get the maximum length of test in in the shortest amount of time. We know what you're thinking, and no, they're not being hypocrites. The water that it uses goes through the fitting, goes into our collection pipes, goes through these pipes back into our treatment area where it's reprocessed, re-chilled, and repressurized so that we can use it again. In this way, our impact as far as water usage is relatively little. It doesn't matter if your shower is tricked out or low flow. Washing in water alone won't do the job. Do everyone around you a favor and look into some other bathroom offerings. At the turn of the 17th century, Queen Elizabeth I boasted that she took a bath once a month, whether I need it or not. Bathroom Tech 2 will return on Modern Marvels. So you're wet, but what's gonna get all that dirt off? Let's ask her. She looks pretty clean. Meet Caridwin Hirschberger of Elgin, Texas. Caridwin is a fourth generation soap maker, catering to those who appreciate craft and tradition. Soap is a basic cleansing agent that can act as a bridge between oil and dirt and water. Soap essentially acts as an emulsifier or something that facilitates the blending of substances that don't normally mix. Oil and dirt on the skin won't combine with water. The emulsifying soap helps disperse water into the oil while detaching it from the surface. The oil and dirt are suspended and diluted so they can be washed away. Caridwin makes soap the old fashioned way, like they did from the 14th to mid 19th century by hand, 
in a cauldron. The most basic components of soap making are some form of grease or fat and lye. Lye can now be synthetically produced or it can be dripped from various types of wood ashes or seaweed ashes. Some experts attribute great historical significance to the humble soap recipe. When soap making became more popular in the 1300s, midwives began washing their hands. And with midwives washing their hands, it led to a decrease in infant mortality rates. So there's certain schools of thought amongst anthropologists that actually soap making helped bring about the Renaissance by increasing the middle class. Caridwin kicks off the soap making process by chopping and melting the rich fat taken from the kidney region of a steer. I'm rendering down the beef tallow, so I'll have a pure fat as opposed to a fat with a lot of connective tissue, meat, blood, things like that. In the cauldron, she combines the tallow with pork lard. Once the fat is melted, she adds in the other active ingredient, alkali. I have a 50% sodium hydroxide or lye water solution. And I'll be adding the lye water to the fats. The fats are at this point at about 100 degrees. Too much lye can be a bad thing. Alkali is caustic. It can cause minor burns to the skin. Uh, nothing spectacular like we saw in Fight Club, but it will cause a minor burn. And then she stirs and stirs. This is actually activating this ponification during which the fatty acids and the oils and the caustic begin to transform into soap. It'll actually start to take on the look of a thick cream gravy or a hot cooked pudding. To test the lye level in a batch of soap brew, Caridwin employs a most sophisticated method. One of the most traditional methods is to taste it. Um, I'm really not kidding. I get a little bit on my finger. And that is almost ready. When the batch is fully cooked, she scoops the batter into a shallow mold, where it'll cool and harden into an alternative to mass-produced soaps. A lot of what sets my soaps apart is what I don't use. I don't use a lot of the more modern synthetic ingredients, because I simply don't feel like they're necessary to make a good soap. And I really don't feel like they're necessary to put on one's skin. <laughs> Mass produced or handmade, soap is just the first line of defense against smelling offensive. But for some, BO is a formidable foe. Body odor is primarily generated in the armpits by a concentration of sweat glands. Moisture secreted by these glands is initially odorless. But the natural lipids, or fats, it contains provide a growth medium for bacteria. These bacteria interact with the lipids, converting them into compounds like isovaleric acid that give sweat that characteristic smell. For centuries, people wanted some way to control body odor. They used different types of perfumes, colognes, before the bath became commonplace. But around 1888, the first trademark deodorant came out. Some of the early products masked bad smells, but caused irritation. Fortunately for modern noses, these products have evolved, so even those with the most sensitive skin can protect themselves. So which to choose, deodorant or antiperspirant? Deodorants mask odor and kill bacteria, but do not reduce wetness. Antiperspirants reduce uh, wetness through inhibiting the production of sweat. The technology controls odor three ways. One, the active ingredient eliminates odor-causing bacteria. Two, the fragrance masks the odor. Three, the reduction in moisture reduces the amount of uh, bacteria that's able to grow. Once antiperspirant is applied, the active ingredient, an aluminum compound, reacts with moisture on the skin and becomes gelatinous. The solution plugs the pores, inhibiting sweat secretion. Regardless of which type of product you use to keep yourself inoffensive, there's a good chance it came from Unilever in Rayford, North Carolina, makers of Degree and other personal care products. 
This is where our liquid unloading takes place at the Rayford factory for the antiperspirant production. We unload our emollients in liquid form from bulk tank trucks into these bulk tanks. They're about 100,000 pound tanks, and it can be pumped at two tons per minute directly into our compounding department. State-of-the-art mixing equipment combines prescribed amounts of liquid ingredients, fragrance, and aluminum compounds, heated to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. Conveyors carry empty canisters ready to be filled with a hot antiperspirant product. We actually have to turn this canister upside down. The way you buy it, it'll be like this. The way we fill it, it's actually like this. Now, when you look inside the container, you see there's a seal. That not only preserves the product, it gives us the ability to fill from the bottom of the container. That gives us a nice dome shape on it, so it's very comfortable when you apply it to your armpit. We then use a piston displacement filler and push the product into the canister. It leaves this filler and heads to a chilling tunnel. We cool it to about 25 degrees Celsius. That's actually to stabilize the product so it doesn't separate and all the ingredients stay very homogeneous throughout. So the canister is plugged with the coated plug and then it enters the labeler. We label first the back of the canister and then rotate it 180 degrees and label the front. The canister is inspected on both sides by a camera system to make sure the label's in the proper position. If it's not, we reject it on the far side. Then, a quick stop at the lab for quality assurance. This is where all the finished products come in and get tested before they are released to the Walmarts, to the targets of the world. We measure the active ingredient concentration in here. We also check for the fragrance, make sure it smells as it's supposed to. The stuff that makes the grade is then packaged, pelletized, wrapped, and shipped. Now you're squeaky clean enough to rule the world. But if you forgot to go before you left the castle, thankfully in the big city stands a mini kingdom with a throne of stainless steel. In 1952, a researcher for Bristol Myers developed the first roll-on deodorant applicator. It was based on the same principle as another recent introduction, the ballpoint pen. Bathroom Tech 2 will return on Modern Marvels. Each year, over 8 million residents, 43 million tourists, and countless commuters cram into New York City. The area boasts close to 20,000 eateries, numerous hotels, theaters, and museums. Yet this metropolis has somehow managed to get the notorious reputation as having nowhere to go. Public toilets have a great need in New York City because of the uh, tremendous amount of people and pedestrians that use the uh, city at all times. It's almost sometimes impossible to find a restaurant or other facility to use during the course of your day. New York City has only about 1,200 public restrooms. That's nothing compared to some other major cities like Singapore, which has about half the population, but nearly 30,000 public restrooms. So how are officials finally addressing the eternal challenge of going on the go? In early 2008, the city of New York introduced the Automatic Pay Toilet, or APT, the latest in public restroom tech. The 6 by 11 foot pay potty sits inconspicuously in Madison Square Park. For the low, low price of 25 cents, the user gets a generous 15 minutes inside the tempered glass and stainless steel unit. Positioning a quarter in the APT uh, activates an electrical signal to the door, which is opened by a uh, reserve of air compression. There's a tank inside the unit that has compressed air, and that activates a pneumatic system that uh, opens the door. Once you're in, you'll see the usual bathroom accoutrements, plus some extras. The features of the APT are the obvious features, including the commode, toilet paper, the basin, the various for soap and rinse water dispensers, a hand dryer. But there's also comfort features like non-slip flooring, a skylight, uh, halogen lighting, as well as uh, heating and air conditioning for um, the, the winters and the summers as well. Since it's unattended, 
the chamber incorporates some innovative safety features. There's uh, battery backup systems should there be a power failure. Uh, the door will automatically open. The emergency buttons in the APT are connected to a sophisticated communication system. And these buttons actually, when pressed, send a text message to two or more people. And also it activates a two-way communication system. Should this person fall on the floor, they're located where they best can reach them. Weight load sensors located under the floor serve a dual purpose. This is to detect an occupant, but also to make sure that occupant falls within certain weight thresholds, above 88 pounds and below 551 pounds. The lower threshold is intended to protect children to make sure they're accompanied, while the upper limit is to make sure that a handicapped person and their assistant can enter the unit, but not excessive numbers of people at the same time. Unfortunately for you slow movers, there's the dreaded time limit. A warning alarm signals when three minutes remain. And when time's up, ready or not, the door slides open. Between users, the APT jumps into action with an automated 90-second self-cleaning process that happens behind closed doors. The automatic pay toilet unit finds its roots with the ancient Roman public latrines. A trench with running water below the stone benches carried away waste. And the enterprising Roman Emperor Vespasian, who charged a fee for use of these latrines, carried away lots of cash. After the fall of the empire and its comforts, relieving oneself happened whenever, wherever nature called. In 17th century France, the nobility at the Palace of Versailles, which was built without bathrooms, did their business on the lawn, and perhaps even in the stairwells. Sanitation and discretion were of little concern. The Sun King himself was known to go while riding in his coach, with female passengers present. Today, when going on the go, the greatest concern is picking up germs in what is potentially one of the least sanitary environments. Hygiene is important, especially in today's world where people are exposed to so many other human beings all the time. Imagine walking into a public restroom and not actually having to touch anything. Perfecting touch-free public bathroom technology is big business. Companies like Sloan and Kimberly Clark manufacture motion sensor activated dispensers of toilet paper, soap, and paper towels. Sensors on toilets and faucets detect a user's presence or absence and operate accordingly. But in most bathrooms, there's still the matter of having to touch paper towels or the traditional hot air dryer. The Dyson Airblade, a touch-free hand dryer, claims to reduce bacteria and use less energy, drying in 10 to 12 seconds, as opposed to the 22 to 40 seconds of most other dryers. It employs the Dyson digital motor that spins faster than a Formula One racing car engine and produces enough air pressure to dry hands without the need for heat. An infrared sensor activates the dryer only when the hands are inserted, so there's no wasted energy after you walk away. But will there ever be a germ-free laboratory experience? Perhaps in the bathroom of the future. According to a study conducted by the Hygiene Council, there are just 295 bacteria per square inch on a typical toilet seat. On a bathroom sink faucet handle, you'll find 6,267 bacteria per square inch. Bathroom Tech 2 will return on Modern Marvels. In the bathroom of the future, human necessity meets science fiction. Japanese bathroom manufacturer Toto has become the undisputed leader in high-tech toilets by combining form and function while taking personal hygiene to a whole new level. Unlike common toilets, Toto's futuristic-looking Neo-Rest model is tankless, rimless, fully automated, and environmentally sound. 
and it offers a less hands-on approach. You don't need to use paper. It takes a little bit of time, you know, <laughs> to dry out. But you don't need to touch by hand. And you need to just touch the button. The water rinse, and then air dries. That's more hygienic than paper. This is a remote control. We have the function of the air cleansing, the front cleansing, also a pressure control, also top side, the flushing, oscillating, pulsing dryer, and then uh, antibacterial plastic for the seat. The Santa Gloss finish on Toto's toilets and sinks is super smooth at the nano level, eliminating crevices where bacteria can accumulate. When you finish, automatically close and seat and lid, and then flushing automatically. Toto's other uber modern products include a digitally controlled air jet bathtub that fills itself to your preset temperature and depth settings. And if you're lonely, it'll even talk to you. Hello, filling the bath. Is drain closed? How about some running water sounds or music? to mask embarrassing noises emanating from the bathroom. No need to waste water on the sound of a courtesy flush. Bathroom manufacturers in the Far East are even working on toilet models that could help relieve any medical concerns. Here's how they might work. On an intelligent toilet, a wand with a small cup attached extends from the rim to collect a sample of urine. The sample travels to a sensor for analysis. The test results are transmitted via the home's wireless network to the user's computer. That uh, data will go to your doctor, and you don't need to go to the routine medical check every year. That is a technology we are looking for in the future. So what other tech might we find in the bathroom of tomorrow? Jacuzzi manufactures a towel warming cabinet that heats up to 120 degrees. For those who need to check their messages, the news or the weather while primping, there's a mirror from Samsung that doubles as a TV monitor. But gadgets aside, the current bathroom trends lean toward indulgence and awareness. Some of the challenges that designers are facing today when they are designing these products is to constantly come up with cutting edge new designs that work and deliver tremendous uh, relaxation as people expect and still be environmentally responsible. It's important that in all the things that are designed for the bathrooms now that we watch how much water we use and people are consciously aware of it and care about that. The bathroom is becoming a place of retreat, a place to relax and rejuvenate. And there's really two trends that are causing that. One is nesting. That's where more and more people are staying home, uh, spending their you know, time and energy and resources on those spaces and the products that go into those spaces. And another one is spa visits. And the number of spa visits are growing every year. And people want to create that, that spa-like atmosphere and get those products into their home. And these tricked out bathrooms might just be scratching the bacteria repelling surface. Coming back from the kitchen and bath show, seeing all the products that are available, we probably haven't seen anything yet. Whether you prefer high tech, low flow, or the lap of luxury, scientists, designers, and engineers will keep finding new ways to keep you comfortable and happy. And it just may change the way you answer.